Chapter Twelve of A Legend of Montrose. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dion Gines, Salt Lake City, Utah. A Legend of Montrose by Sir Walter Scott. Chapter Twelve for close designs and crooked counsels fit sagacious bold and turbulent of wit restless unfixed in principle and place in power unpleased impatient in disgrace absalom and achitophel the village of inverary now a neat country town then partook of the rudeness of the seventeenth century in the miserable appearance of the houses and the irregularity of the unpaved street but a stronger and more terrible characteristic of the period appeared in the market-place which was a space of irregular width half-way betwixt the harbour or pier and the frowning castle gate which terminated with its gloomy archway portcullis and flankers the upper end of the vista midway this space was erected a rude gibbet on which hung five dead bodies two of which from their dress seemed to have been lowlanders and the other three corpses were muffled in their highland plaids two or three women sat under the gallows who seemed to be mourning and singing the coronach of the deceased in a low voice but the spectacle was apparently of too ordinary occurrence to have much interest for the inhabitants at large who while they thronged to look at the military figure the horse of an unusual size and the burnished panoply of captain dalgetty seemed to bestow no attention whatever on the piteous spectacle which their own market-place afforded the envoy of montrose was not quite so indifferent and hearing a word or two of english escape from a highlander of decent appearance he immediately halted gustavus and addressed him the provost marshal has been busy here my friend may i crave of you what these delinquents have been justified for he looked towards the gibbet as he spoke and the gale comprehending his meaning rather by his action than his words immediately replied three gentlemen caterans god sain them crossing himself twa sassenach bits o bodies that wadna do something that macallum more bade them and turning from dalgetty with an air of indifference away he walked staying no farther question dalgetty shrugged his shoulders and proceeded for sir duncan campbell's tenth or twelfth cousin had already shown some signs of impatience at the gate of the castle another terrible spectacle of feudal power awaited him within a stockade or palisade which seemed lately to have been added to the defences of the gate and which was protected by two pieces of light artillery was a small enclosure where stood a huge block on which lay an axe both were smeared with recent blood and a quantity of sawdust strode around partly retained and partly obliterated the marks of a very late execution as dalgetty looked on this new object of terror his principal guide suddenly twitched him by the skirt of his jerkin and having thus attracted his attention winked and pointed with his finger to a pole fixed on the stockade which supported a human head being that doubtless of the late sufferer there was a leer on the highlander's face as he pointed to this ghastly spectacle which seemed to his fellow-traveller ominous of nothing good dalgetty dismounted from his horse at the gateway and gustavus was taken from him without his being permitted to attend him to the stable according to his custom this gave the soldier a pang which the apparatus of death had not conveyed poor gustavus said he to himself if anything but good happens to me i had better have left him at darnlinverac 
than brought him here among these highland savages who scarce know the head of a horse from his tail but duty must part a man from his nearest and dearest when the cannons are roaring lads and the colours are flying the lads that seek honour must never fear dying then stout cavaliers let us toil our brave trade in and fight for the gospel and the bold king of sweden thus silencing his apprehensions with the butt-end of a military ballad he followed his guide into a sort of guard-room filled with armed highlanders it was intimated to him that he must remain here until his arrival was communicated to the marquis to make this communication the more intelligible the doughty captain gave to the dunny wassel sir duncan campbell's packet desiring as well as he could by signs that it should be delivered into the marquis's own hand his guide nodded and withdrew the captain was left about half an hour in this place to endure with indifference or return with scorn the inquisitive and at the same time the inimical glances of the armed gale to whom his exterior and equipage were as much subject of curiosity as his person and country seemed matter of dislike all this he bore with military nonchalance until at the expiration of the above period a person dressed in black velvet and wearing a gold chain like a modern magistrate of edinburgh but who was in fact steward of the household to the marquis of argyle entered the apartment and invited with solemn gravity the captain to follow him to his master's presence the suite of apartments through which he passed were filled with attendants or visitors of various descriptions disposed perhaps with some ostentation in order to impress the envoy of montrose with an idea of the superior power and magnificence belonging to the rival house of argyle one anteroom was filled with lackeys arrayed in brown and yellow the colours of the family who ranged in double file gazed in silence upon captain dalgetty as he passed betwixt their ranks another was occupied by highland gentlemen and chiefs of small branches who were amusing themselves with chess backgammon and other games which they scarce intermitted to gaze with curiosity upon the stranger a third was filled with lowland gentlemen and officers who seemed also in attendance and lastly the presence chamber of the marquis himself showed him attended by a levy which marked his high importance this apartment the folding doors of which were opened for the reception of captain dalgetty was a long gallery decorated with tapestry and family portraits and having a vaulted ceiling of open woodwork the extreme projections of the beams being richly carved and gilded the gallery was lighted by long lanceolated gothic casements divided by heavy shafts and filled with painted glass where the sunbeams glimmered dimly through boars heads and galleys and batons and swords armorial bearings of the powerful house of argyle and emblems of the high hereditary offices of justiciary of scotland and master of the royal household which they had long enjoyed at the upper end of this magnificent gallery stood the marquis himself the centre of a splendid circle of highland and lowland gentlemen all richly dressed among whom were two or three of the clergy called in perhaps to be witnesses of his lordship's zeal for the covenant the marquis himself was dressed in the fashion of the period which van dyck has so often painted but his habit was sober and uniform in colour and rather rich than gay his dark complexion furrowed forehead and downcast look gave him the appearance of one frequently engaged in the consideration of important affairs and who has acquired by long habit an air of gravity and mystery which he cannot shake off even where there is nothing to be concealed the cast with his eyes 
which had procured him in the highlands the nickname of gillespie grumach or the grim was less perceptible when he looked downward which perhaps was one cause of his having adopted that habit in person he was tall and thin but not without that dignity of deportment and manners which became his high rank something there was cold in his address and sinister in his look although he spoke and behaved with the usual grace of a man of such quality he was adored by his own clan whose advancement he had greatly studied although he was in proportion disliked by the highlanders of other septs some of whom he had already stripped of their possessions while others conceived themselves in danger from his future schemes and all dreaded the height to which he was elevated we have already noticed that in displaying himself amidst his counsellors his officers of the household and his train of vassals allies and dependents the marquis of argyle probably wished to make an impression on the nervous system of captain dugald dalgetty but that doughty person had fought his way in one department or another through the greater part of the thirty years war in germany a period when a brave and successful soldier was a companion for princes the king of sweden and after his example even the haughty princes of the empire had founded themselves fain frequently to compound with their dignity and silence when they could not satisfy the pecuniary claims of their soldiers by admitting them to unusual privileges and familiarity captain dugald dalgetty had it to boast that he had sat with princes at feasts made for monarchs and therefore was not a person to be browbeat even by the dignity which surrounded Macallum moore indeed he was naturally by no means the most modest man in the world but on the contrary had so good an opinion of himself that into whatever company he chanced to be thrown he was always proportionally elevated in his own conceit so that he felt as much at ease in the most exalted society as among his own ordinary companions in this high opinion of his own rank he was greatly fortified by his ideas of the military profession which in his phrase made a valiant cavalier a camarade to an emperor when introduced therefore into the marquis's presence chamber he advanced to the upper end with an air of more confidence than grace and would have gone close up to argyle's person before speaking had not the latter waved his hand as a signal to him to stop short captain dalgetty did so accordingly and having made his military congee with easy confidence he thus accosted the marquis give you good morrow my lord or rather i should say good even beso a usted los manos as the spaniard says who are you sir and what is your business demanded the marquis in a tone which was intended to interrupt the offensive familiarity of the soldier that is a fair interrogative my lord answered dalgetty which i shall forthwith answer as becomes a cavalier and that preemptory as we used to say at marshall college see who or what he is neil said the marquis sternly to a gentleman who stood near him i will save the honourable gentleman the labour of investigation continued the captain i am dugald dalgetty of drumthwacket that should be late ritmaster in various services and now major as i know not what or whose regiment of irishes and i am come with a flag of truce from a high and powerful lord james earl of montrose and other noble persons now in arms for his majesty and so god save king charles do you know where you are and the danger of dallying with us sir again demanded the marquis that you reply to me as if i were a child or a fool the earl of montrose is with the english malignants and i suspect 
you are one of those irish runnagates who are come into this country to burn and slay as they did under sir phelim o'neill my lord replied captain dalgetty i am no renegade though a major of irishes for which i might refer your lordship to the invincible gustavus adolphus the lion of the north to bannier to oxenstern to the warlike duke of saxe weimar tilly wallenstein piccolomini and other great captains both dead and living and touching the noble earl of montrose i pray your lordship to peruse these my full powers for treating with you in the name of that right honourable commander the marquis looked slightingly at the signed and sealed paper which captain dalgetty handed to him and throwing it with contempt upon a table asked those around him what he deserved who came as the avowed envoy and agent of malignant traitors in arms against the state a high gallows and a short shrift was the ready answer of one of the bystanders i will crave of that honourable cavalier who hath last spoken said dalgetty to be less hasty in forming his conclusions and also of your lordship to be cautious in adopting the same in respect such threats are to be held out only to base besognos and not to men of spirit and action who are bound to peril themselves as freely in services of this nature as upon sieges battles or onslaughts of any sort and albeit i have not with me a trumpet or a white flag in respect our army is not yet equipped with its full appointments yet the honourable cavaliers and your lordship must concede unto me that the sanctity of an envoy who cometh on matter of truth or parley consisteth not in the fanfare of a trumpet whilk is but a sound or in the flap of a white flag whilk is but an old rag in itself but in the confidence reposed by the party sending and the party sent in the honour of those to whom the message is to be carried and their full reliance that they will respect the jus gentium as well as the law of arms in the person of the commissionate you are not come hither to lecture us upon the law of arms sir said the marquis which neither does nor can apply to rebels and insurgents but to suffer the penalty of your insolence and folly for bringing a traitorous message to the lord justice-general of scotland whose duty calls upon him to punish such an offence with death gentlemen said the captain who began much to dislike the turn which his mission seemed about to take i pray you to remember that the earl of montrose will hold you and your possessions liable for whatever injury my person or my horse shall sustain by these unseemly proceedings and that he will be justified in executing retributive vengeance on your persons and possessions this menace was received with a scornful laugh while one of the campbells replied it is a far cry to lochow proverbial expression of the tribe meaning that their ancient hereditary domains lay beyond the reach of an invading enemy but gentlemen further urged the unfortunate captain who was unwilling to be condemned without at least the benefit of a full hearing although it is not for me to say how far it may be to lochow in respect i am a stranger to these parts yet what is more to the purpose i trust you will admit that i have the guarantee of an honourable gentleman of your own name sir duncan campbell of ardenvor for my safety on this mission and i pray you to observe that in breaking the truce towards me you will highly prejudicate his honour and fair fame this seemed to be new information to many of the gentlemen for they spoke aside with each other and the marquis's face notwithstanding his power of suppressing all external signs of his passions showed impatience and vexation 
does sir duncan of ardenvoir pledge his honour for this person's safety my lord said one of the company addressing the marquis i do not believe it answered the marquis but i have not yet had time to read his letter we will pray your lordship to do so said another of the campbells our name must not suffer discredit through the means of such a fellow as this a dead fly said a clergyman maketh the ointment of the apothecary to stink reverend sir said captain dalgetty in respect of the use to be derived i forgive you the unsavouriness of your comparison and also remit to the gentleman in the red bonnet the disparaging epithet of fellow which he has discourteously applied to me who am no way to be distinguished by the same unless in so far as i have been called fellow-soldier by the great gustavus adolphus the lion of the north and other choice commanders both in germany and the low countries but touching sir duncan campbell's guarantee of my safety i will gauge my life upon his making my words good thereanent when he comes hither to-morrow if sir duncan be soon expected my lord said one of the intercessors it would be a pity to anticipate matters with this poor man besides that said another your lordship i speak with reverence should at least consult the knight of ardenvor's letter and learn the terms on which this major dalgetty as he calls himself has been sent hither by him they closed around the marquis and conversed together in a low tone both in gaelic and english the patriarchal power of the chiefs was very great and that of the marquis of argyle armed with all his grants of hereditary jurisdiction was particularly absolute but there interferes some check of one kind or another even in the most despotic government that which mitigated the power of the celtic chiefs was the necessity which they lay under of conciliating the kinsmen who under them led out the lower orders to battle and who formed a sort of council of the tribe in time of peace the marquis on this occasion thought himself under the necessity of attending to the remonstrances of this senate or more properly coralte of the name of campbell and slipping out of the circle gave orders for the prisoner to be removed to a place of security prisoner exclaimed dalgetty exerting himself with such force as well nigh to shake off two highlanders who for some minutes past had waited the signal to seize him and kept for that purpose close at his back indeed the soldier had so nearly attained his liberty that the marquis of argyle changed colour and stepped back two paces laying however his hand on his sword while several of his clan with ready devotion threw themselves betwixt him and the apprehended vengeance of the prisoner but the highland guards were too strong to be shaken off and the unlucky captain after having had his offensive weapons taken from him was dragged off and conducted through several gloomy passages to a small side door grated with iron within which was another of wood these were opened by a grim old highlander with a long white beard and displayed a very steep and narrow flight of steps leading downward the captain's guards pushed him down two or three steps then unloosing his arms left him to grope his way down to the bottom as he could a task which became difficult and even dangerous when the two doors being successively locked left the prisoner in total darkness end of chapter twelve chapter thirteen of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording a librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter thirteen whatever stranger visits here we pity his sad case 
unless to worship he draw near the king of kings his grace burns epigram on a visit to inverary the captain finding himself deprived of light in the manner we have described and placed in a very uncertain situation proceeded to descend the narrow and broken stair with all the caution in his power hoping that he might find at the bottom some place to repose himself but with all his care he could not finally avoid making a false step which brought him down the four or five last steps too hastily to preserve his equilibrium at the bottom he stumbled over a bundle of something soft which stirred and uttered a groan so deranging the captain's descent that he floundered forward and finally fell upon his hands and knees on the floor of a damp and stone-paved dungeon when dalgetty had recovered his first demand was to know over whom he had stumbled he was a man a month since answered a hollow and broken voice and what is he now then said dalgetty that he thinks it fitting to lie upon the lowest step of the stairs and clued up like a hurchin that honourable cavaliers who chance to be in trouble may break their noses over him what is he now replied the same voice he is a wretched trunk from which the boughs have one by one been lopped away and which cares little how soon it is torn up and hewed into billets for the furnace friend said dalgetty i am sorry for you but patienza as the spaniard says if you had but been as quiet as a log as you call yourself i should have saved some exorciations on my hands and knees you are a soldier replied his fellow-prisoner do you complain on account of a fall for which a boy would not bemoan himself a soldier said the captain and how do you know in this cursed dark cavern that i am a soldier i heard your armour clash as you fell replied the prisoner and now i see it glimmer when you have remained as long as i in this darkness your eyes will distinguish the smallest eft that crawls on the floor i had rather the devil picked them out said dalgetty if this be the case i shall wish for a short turn of the rope a soldier's prayer and a leap from a ladder but what sort of provant have you got here what food i mean brother in affliction bread and water once a day replied the voice prithee friend let me taste your loaf said dalgetty i hope we shall play good comrades while we dwell together in this abominable pit the loaf and jar of water answered the other prisoner stand in the corner two steps to your right hand take them and welcome with earthly food i have well nigh done dalgetty did not wait for a second invitation but groping out the provisions began to munch at the stale black oaten loaf with as much heartiness as we have seen him play his part at better viands this bread he said muttering with his mouth full at the same time is not very savoury nevertheless it is not much worse than that which we ate at the famous leaguer at Werben, where the valorous gustavus foiled all the efforts of the celebrated tilly that terrible old hero who had driven two kings out of the field namely ferdinand of bohemia and christian of denmark and anent this water which is none of the most sweet i drink in the same to your speedy deliverance comrade not forgetting mine own and devoutly wishing it were rhenish wine or humming lubeck beer at the least were it but in honour of the pledge while dalgetty ran on in this way his teeth kept time with his tongue and he speedily finished the provisions which the benevolence or indifference of his companion in misfortune had abandoned to his veracity when this task was accomplished he wrapped himself in his cloak 
and seating himself in a corner of the dungeon in which he could obtain a support on each side for he had always been an admirer of elbow chairs he remarked even from his youth upward he began to question his fellow captive mine honest friend said he you and i being comrades at bed and board should be better acquainted i am dugald dalgetty of drumthwacket and so forth major in a regiment of loyal irishes and envoy extraordinary of a high and mighty lord james earl of montrose pray what may your name be it will avail you little to know replied his more taciturn companion let me judge of that matter answered the soldier well then ronald mackay is my name that is ronald son of the mist son of the mist ejaculated dalgetty son of utter darkness say i but ronald since that is your name how came you in possession of the provost's court of guard what the devil brought you here that is to say my misfortunes and my crimes answered ronald know ye the knight of ardenvor i do know that honourable person replied dalgetty but know ye where he is now replied ronald fasting this day at ardenvor answered the envoy that he may feast to-morrow at inverary in which last purpose if he chance to fail my lease of human service will be something precarious then let him know one claims his intercession who is his worst foe and his best friend answered ronald truly i shall desire to carry a less questionable message answered dalgetty sir duncan is not a person to play at reading riddles with craven saxon said the prisoner tell him i am the raven that fifteen years since stooped on his tower of strength and the pledges he had left there i am the hunter that found out the wolf's den on the rock and destroyed his offspring i am the leader of the band which surprised ardenvor yesterday was fifteen years and gave his four children to the sword truly my honest friend said dalgetty if that is your best recommendation to sir duncan's favour i would pretermit my pleading thereupon in respect i have observed that even the animal creation are incensed against those who intromit with their offspring forcibly much more any rational and christian creatures who have had violence done upon their small family but i pray you in courtesy to tell me whether you assailed the castle from the hillock called drumsnab whilk i uphold to be the true point of attack unless it were to be protected by a sconce we ascended the cliff by ladders of withies or saplings said the prisoner drawn up by an accomplice and clansman who had served six months in the castle to enjoy that one night of unlimited vengeance the owl hooped around us as we hung betwixt heaven and earth the tide roared against the foot of the rock and dashed asunder our skiff yet no man's heart failed him in the morning there was blood and ashes where there had been peace and joy at sunset it was a pretty camisade i doubt not ronald mackay a very sufficient onslaught and not unworthily discharged nevertheless i would have pressed the house from that little hillock called drumsnab but yours is a pretty irregular scythian fashion of warfare ronald much resembling that of turks tartars and other asiatic people but the reason my friend the cause of this war the terrarima casa as i may say deliver me that ronald we had been pushed at by the macaulays and other western tribes said ronald till our possessions became unsafe for us aha said dalgetty i have faint remembrance of having heard of that matter did you not put bread and cheese into a man's mouth when he had never a stomach whereunto to transmit the same you have heard then said ronald 
the tale of our revenge on the haughty forester i bethink me that i have said dalgetty and that not of an old date it was a merry jest that of cramming the bread into the dead man's mouth but somewhat too wild and savage for civilized acceptation besides wasting the good victuals i have seen when at a siege or a leaguer ronald a living soldier would have been the better ronald for that crust of bread whilk you threw away on a dead pow we were attacked by sir duncan continued mackay and my brother was slain his head was withering on the battlements which we scaled i vowed revenge and it is a vow i have never broken it may be so said dalgetty and every thoroughbred soldier will confess that revenge is a sweet morsel but in what manner this story will interest sir duncan in your justification unless it should move him to intercede with the marquis to change the manner thereof from hanging or simple suspension to breaking your limbs on the rue or wheel with the coulter of a plough or otherwise putting you to death by torture surpasses my comprehension were i you ronald i would be for miskenning sir duncan keeping my own secret and departing quietly by suffocation like your ancestors before you yet hearken stranger said the highlander sir duncan of ardenvor had four children three died under our dirks but the fourth survives and more would he give to dandel on his knee the fourth child which remains than to rack these old bones which care little for the utmost indulgence of his wrath one word if i list to speak it could turn his day of humiliation and fasting into a day of thankfulness and rejoicing and breaking of bread oh i know it by my own heart dearer to me is the child kenneth who chaseth the butterfly on the banks of the avon than ten sons who are mouldering in earth or are preyed on by the fowls of the air i presume ronald continued dalgetty that the three pretty fellows whom i saw yonder in the market-place strung up by the head like rizzard haddocks claimed some interest in you there was a brief pause ere the highlander replied in a tone of strong emotion they were my sons stranger they were my sons blood of my blood bone of my bone fleet of foot unerring in aim unvanquished by foremen till the sons of diarmid overcame them by numbers why do i wish to survive them the old trunk will less feel the rending up of its roots than it has felt the lopping off of its graceful boughs but kenneth must be trained to revenge the young eagle must learn from the old how to stoop on his foes i will purchase for his sake my life and my kingdom by discovering my secret to the knight of ardenvor you may attain your end more easily said a third voice mingling in the conference by entrusting it to me all highlanders are superstitious the enemy of mankind is among us said ronald mackay springing to his feet his chains clattered as he rose while he drew himself as far as they permitted from the quarter whence the voice appeared to proceed his fear in some degree communicated itself to captain dalgetty who began to repeat in a sort of polyglot gibberish all the exorcisms he had ever heard of without being able to remember more than a word or two of each in nomine domini as we said at marischal college santissima madre de dios as the spaniard has it alle guten geister loben den herrn saith the blessed psalmist in dr luther's translation a truce with your exorcisms said the voice they had heard before though i come strangely among you i am mortal like yourselves and my assistance may avail you in your present strait if you are not too proud to be counselled while the stranger thus spoke he withdrew the shade of a dark lantern by whose feeble light 
dalgetty could only discern that the speaker who had thus mysteriously united himself to their company and mixed in their conversation was a tall man dressed in a livery cloak of the marquis his first glance was to his feet but he saw neither the cloven foot which scottish legends assign to the foul fiend nor the horse's hoof by which he is distinguished in germany his first enquiry was how the stranger had come among them for said he the creak of these rusty bars would have been heard had the door been made patent and if you passed through the keyhole truly sir put what face you will on it you are not fit to be enrolled in a regiment of living men i reserve my secret answered the stranger until you shall merit the discovery by communicating to me some of yours it may be that i shall be moved to let you out where i myself came in it cannot be through the keyhole then said captain dalgetty for my corslet would stick in the passage were it possible that my headpiece could get through as for secrets i have none of my own and but few appertaining to others but impart to us what secrets you desire to know or as professor snufflegreek used to say at the marshall college aberdeen speak that i may know thee it is not with you i have first to do replied the stranger turning his light full on the mild and wasted features and the large limbs of the highlander ronald mackay who close drawn up against the walls of the dungeon seemed yet uncertain whether his guest was a living being i have brought you something my friend said the stranger in a more soothing tone to mend your fare if you are to die to-morrow it is no reason wherefore you should not live to-night none at all no reason in the creation replied the ready captain dalgetty who forthwith began to unpack the contents of a small basket which the stranger had brought under his cloak while the highlander either in suspicion or disdain paid no attention to the good cheer here's to thee my friend said the captain who having already dispatched a huge piece of roasted kid was now taking a pull at the wine-flask what is thy name my good friend murdoch campbell sir answered the servant a lackey of the marquis of argyle and occasionally acting as under-warden then here is to thee once more murdoch said dalgetty drinking to you by your proper name for the better luck sake this wine i take to be calcavella well honest murdoch i take it on me to say thou deservest to be upper warden since thou showest thyself twenty times better acquainted with the way of victualling honest gentlemen that are under misfortune than thy principal bread and water out upon him it was enough murdoch to destroy the credit of the marquis's dungeon but i see you would converse with my friend ronald mackay here never mind my presence i'll get me into this corner with the basket and i will warrant my jaws make noise enough to prevent my ears from hearing you notwithstanding this promise however the veteran listened with all the attention he could to gather their discourse or as he described it himself laid his ears back in his neck like gustavus when he heard the key turn in the gurnal kist he could therefore owing to the narrowness of the dungeon easily overhear the following dialogue are you aware son of the mist said the campbell that you will never leave this place excepting for the gibbet those who are dearest to me answered mackay have trod that path before me then you would do nothing asked the visitor to shun following them the prisoner writhed himself in his chains before returning an answer i would do much at length he said not for my own life but for the sake of the pledge in the glen of strath avon and what would you do to turn away the bitterness of the hour again demanded murdoch 
i care not for what cause ye mean to shun it i would do what a man might do and still call himself a man do you call yourself a man said the interrogator who have done the deeds of a wolf i do answered the outlaw i am a man like my forefathers while wrapped in the mantle of peace we were lambs it was rent from us and ye now call us wolves give us the huts ye have burned our children whom ye have murdered our widows whom ye have starved collect from the gibbet and the pole the mangled carcasses and whitened skulls of our kinsmen bid them live and bless us and we will be your vassals and brothers till then let death and blood and mutual wrong draw a dark veil of division between us you will then do nothing for your liberty said the campbell anything but call myself the friend of your tribe answered mackay we scorn the friendship of banditti and caterans retorted murdoch and would not stoop to accept it what i demand to know from you in exchange for your liberty is where the daughter and heiress of the knight of ardenvor is now to be found that you may wed her to some beggarly kinsman of your great master said ronald after the fashion of the children of diarmid does not the valley of glenorquhy to this very hour cry shame on the violence offered to a helpless infant whom her kinsmen were conveying to the court of the sovereign were not her escort compelled to hide her beneath a cauldron round which they fought till not one remained to tell the tale and was not the girl brought to this fatal castle and afterwards wedded to the brother of Macallum moore and all for the sake of her broad lands such a story is told of the heiress of the clan of calder who was made prisoner in the manner described and afterwards wedded to sir duncan campbell from which union the campbells of cawdor have their descent and if the tale be true said murdoch she had a preferment beyond what the king of scots would have conferred on her but this is far from the purpose the daughter of sir duncan of ardenvor is of our own blood not a stranger and who has so good a right to know her fate as Macallum moore the chief of her clan it is on his part then that you demand it said the outlaw the domestic of the marquis assented and you will practise no evil against the maiden i have done her wrong enough already no evil upon the word of a christian man replied murdoch and my guerdon is to be life and liberty said the child of the mist such is our paction replied the campbell then know that the child whom i saved out of compassion at the spoiling of her father's tower of strength was bred as an adopted daughter of our tribe until we were worsted at the pass of baldenduthel by the fiend incarnate and mortal enemy of our tribe allan macaulay of the bloody hand and by the horsemen of lennox under the heir of menteith fell she into the power of allan of the bloody hand said murdoch and she a reputed daughter of thy tribe then her blood has gilded the dirk and thou hast said nothing to rescue thine own forfeited life if my life rest on hers answered the outlaw it is secure for she still survives but it has a more insecure reliance the frail promise of a son of diarmid that promise shall not fail you said the campbell if you can assure me that she survives and where she is to be found in the castle of darlinverac said ronald mackay under the name of anna lyle i have often heard of her from my kinsmen who have again approached their native woods and it is not long since mine old eyes beheld her you said murdoch in astonishment you a chief among the children of the mist and ventured so near your mortal foe son of diarmid i did more replied the outlaw 
i was in the hall of the castle disguised as a harper from the wild shores of skianak my purpose was to have plunged my dirk in the body of the macaulay with the bloody hand before whom our race trembles and to have taken thereafter what fate god should send me but i saw annot lyle even when my hand was on the hilt of my dagger she touched her clairshack harp to a song of the children of the mist which she had learned when her dwelling was amongst us the woods in which we had dwelt pleasantly rustled their green leaves in the song and our streams were there with the sound of all their waters my hand forsook the dagger the fountains of mine eyes were opened and the hour of revenge passed away and now son of diarmid have i not paid the ransom of my head ay replied murdoch if your tale be true but what proof can you assign for it bear witness heaven and earth exclaimed the outlaw he already looks how he may step over his word not so replied murdoch every promise shall be kept to you when i am assured you have told me the truth but i must speak a few words with your companion in captivity fair and false ever fair and false muttered the prisoner as he threw himself once more on the floor of his dungeon meanwhile captain dalgetty who had attended to every word of this dialogue was making his own remarks on it in private what the hanker can this sly fellow have to say to me i have no child either of my own so far as i know or of any other person to tell him a tale about but let him come on he will have some manoeuvring ere he turn the flank of the old soldier accordingly as if he had stood pike in hand to defend a breach he waited with caution but without fear the commencement of the attack you are a citizen of the world captain dalgetty said murdoch campbell and cannot be ignorant of our old scotch proverb gifgaff in old english ka me ka thee i e mutually serving each other which goes through all nations and all services then i should know something of it said dalgetty for except the turks there are few powers in europe whom i have not served and i have sometimes thought of taking a turn either with betham gabor or with the janizaries a man of your experience and unprejudiced ideas then will understand me at once said murdoch when i say i mean that your freedom shall depend on your true and upright answer to a few trifling questions respecting the gentlemen you have left their state of preparation the number of their men and nature of their appointments and as much as you chance to know about their plan of operations just to satisfy your curiosity said dalgetty and without any farther purpose none in the world replied murdoch what interest should a poor devil like me take in their operations make your interrogations then said the captain and i will answer them peremptory how many irish may be on their march to join james graham the delinquent probably ten thousand said captain dalgetty ten thousand replied murdoch angrily we know that scarce two thousand landed at ardnamurchan then you know more about them than i do answered captain dalgetty with great composure i never saw them mustered yet or even under arms and how many men of the clans may be expected demanded murdoch as many as they can make replied the captain you are answering from the purpose sir said murdoch speak plainly will there be five thousand men there and thereabouts answered dalgetty you are playing with your life sir if you trifle with me replied the catechist one whistle of mine and in less than ten minutes your head hangs on the drawbridge but to speak candidly mr murdoch replied the captain do you think it is a reasonable thing to ask me after the secrets of our army 
and i engaged to serve for the whole campaign if i taught you how to defeat montrose what becomes of my pay arrears and chance of booty i tell you said campbell that if you be stubborn your campaign shall begin and end in a march to the block at the castle gate which stands ready for such landlaufers but if you answer my questions faithfully i will receive you into my into the service of macallum more does the service afford good pay said captain dalgetty he will double yours if you will return to montrose and act under his direction i wish i had seen you sir before taking on with him said dalgetty appearing to meditate on the contrary i can afford you more advantageous terms now said the campbell always supposing that you are faithful faithful that is to you and a traitor to montrose answered the captain faithful to the cause of religion and good order answered murdoch which sanctifies any deception you may employ to serve it and the marquis of argyle should i incline to enter his service is he a kind master demanded dalgetty never man kinder quoth campbell and bountiful to his officers pursued the captain the most open hand in scotland replied murdoch true and faithful to his engagements continued dalgetty as honourable a nobleman as breathes said the clansman i never heard so much good of him before said dalgetty you must know the marquis well or rather you must be the marquis himself lord of argyle he added throwing himself suddenly on the disguised nobleman i arrest you in the name of king charles as a traitor if you venture to call for assistance i will wrench round your neck the attack which dalgetty made upon argyle's person was so sudden and unexpected that he easily prostrated him on the floor of the dungeon and held him down with one hand while his right grasping the marquis's throat was ready to strangle him on the slightest attempt to call for assistance lord of argyle he said it is now my turn to lay down the terms of capitulation if you list to show me the private way by which you entered the dungeon you shall escape on condition of being my locum tenens as we said at the marshal college until your warder visits his prisoners but if not i will first strangle you i learned the art from a polonian haydock who had been a slave in the ottoman seraglio and then seek out a mode of retreat villain you would not murder me for my kindness murmured argyle not for your kindness my lord replied dalgetty but first to teach your lordship the jess gentium towards cavaliers who come to you under safe conduct and secondly to warn you of the danger of proposing dishonourable terms to any worthy soldado in order to tempt him to become false to his standard during the term of his service spare my life said argyle and i will do as you require dalgetty maintained his grip upon the marquis's throat compressing it a little while he asked questions and relaxing it so far as to give him the power of answering them where is the secret door into the dungeon he demanded hold up the lantern to the corner on your right hand you will discern the iron which covers the spring replied the marquis so far so good where does the passage lead to to my private apartment behind the tapestry answered the prostrate nobleman from thence how shall i reach the gateway through the grand gallery the anteroom the lackeys waiting hall the grand guard-room all crowded with soldiers factionaries and attendants that will never do for me my lord have you no secret passage to the gate as you have to your dungeons i have seen such in germany there is a passage through the chapel said the marquis opening from my apartment and what is the password at the gate the sword of levy replied the marquis but if you will receive my pledge of honour i will go with you 
escort you through every guard and set you at full liberty with a passport i might trust you my lord were your throat not already black with the grasp of my fingers as it is beso los manos a usted as the spaniard says yet you may grant me a passport are there writing materials in your apartment surely and blank passports ready to be signed i will attend you there said the marquis instantly it were too much honour for the like of me said dalgetty your lordship shall remain under charge of mine honest friend ronald mackay therefore prithee let me drag you within reach of his chain honest ronald you see how matters stand with us i shall find the means i doubt not of setting you at freedom meantime do as you see me do clap your hand thus on the weasand of this high and mighty prince under his ruff and if he offer to struggle or cry out fail not my worthy ronald to squeeze doughtily and if it be ad deliquium ronald that is till he swoon there is no great matter seeing he designed your gullet and mine to still harder usage if he offer at speech or struggle said ronald he dies by my hand that is right ronald very spirited a thorough-going friend that understands a hint is worth a million thus resigning the charge of the marquis to his new confederate dalgetty pressed the spring by which the secret door flew open though so well were its hinges polished and oiled that it made not the slightest noise in revolving the opposite side of the door was secured by very strong bolts and bars beside which hung one or two keys designed apparently to undo fetterlocks a narrow staircase ascending up through the thickness of the castle wall landed as the marquis had truly informed him behind the tapestry of his private apartment such communications were frequent in old feudal castles as they gave the lord of the fortress like a second dionysius the means of hearing the conversation of his prisoners or if he pleased of visiting them in disguise an experiment which had terminated so unpleasantly on the present occasion for gillespie grumach having examined previously whether there was any one in the apartment and finding the coast clear the captain entered and hastily possessing himself of a blank passport several of which lay on the table and of writing materials securing at the same time the marquis's dagger and a silk cord from the hangings he again descended into the cavern where listening a moment at the door he could hear the half-stifled voice of the marquis making great proffers to mackay on condition he would suffer him to give an alarm not for a forest of deer not for a thousand head of cattle answered the freebooter not for all the lands that ever called a son of diarmid master will i break the troth i have plighted to him of the iron garment he of the iron garment said dalgetty entering is bounden unto you mackay and this noble lord shall be bounden also but first he must fill up this passport with the names of major dugald dalgetty and his guide or he is like to have a passport to another world the marquis subscribed and wrote by the light of the dark lantern as the soldier prescribed to him and now ronald said dalgetty strip thy upper garment thy plaid i mean ronald and in it will i muffle the macallum more and make of him for the time a child of the mist nay i must bring it over your head my lord so as to secure us against your mistimed clamour so now he is sufficiently muffled hold down your hands or by heaven i will stab you to the heart with your own dagger nay you shall be bound with nothing less than silk as your quality deserves so now he is secure till some one comes to relieve him if he ordered us a late dinner ronald he is like to be the sufferer at what hour my good ronald did the jailer usually appear 
never till the sun was beneath the western wave said mackay then my friend we shall have three hours good said the cautious captain in the meantime let us labor for your liberation to examine ronald's chain was the next occupation it was undone by means of one of the keys which hung behind the private door probably deposited there that the marquis might if he pleased dismiss a prisoner or remove him elsewhere without the necessity of summoning the warden the outlaw stretched his benumbed arms and bounded from the floor of the dungeon in all the ecstasy of recovered freedom take the livery coat of that noble prisoner said captain dalgetty put it on and follow close at my heels the outlaw obeyed they ascended the private stair having first secured the door behind them and thus safely reached the apartment of the marquis the precarious state of the feudal nobles introduced a great deal of espionage into their castles sir robert carey mentions his having put on the cloak of one of his own wardens to obtain a confession from the mouth of geordie bourne his prisoner whom he caused presently to be hanged in return for the frankness of his communication the fine old border castle of Naworth contains a private stair from the apartment of the lord william howard by which he could visit the dungeon as is alleged in the preceding chapter to have been practised by the marquis of argyle End of chapter 13chapter fourteen of a legend of montrose this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by dion gines salt lake city utah a legend of montrose by sir walter scott chapter fourteen this was the entry then these stairs but whither after yet he that sure to perish on the land may quit the nicety of card and compass and trust the open sea without a pilot tragedy of benevolt look out for the private way through the chapel ronald said the captain while i give a hasty regard to these matters thus speaking he seized with one hand a bundle of argyle's most private papers and with the other a purse of gold both of which lay in a drawer of a rich cabinet which stood invitingly open neither did he neglect to possess himself of a sword and pistols with powder-flask and balls which hung in the apartment intelligence and booty said the veteran as he pouched the spoils each honourable cavalier should look to the one on his general's behalf and the other on his own this sword is an andrew ferrara and the pistols better than mine own but a fair exchange is no robbery soldados are not to be endangered and endangered gratuitously my lord of argyle but soft soft ronald wise man of the mist whither art thou bound it was indeed full time to stop mackay's proceedings for not finding the private passage readily and impatient it would seem of farther delay he had caught down a sword and target and was about to enter the great gallery with the purpose doubtless of fighting his way through all opposition hold while you live whispered dalgetty laying hold on him we must be perdue if possible so bar we this door that it may be thought Macallum Moore would be private, and now let me make a reconnaissance for the private passage. By looking behind the tapestry in various places, the captain at length discovered a private door, and behind that a winding passage terminated by another door which doubtless entered the chapel. But what was his disagreeable surprise to hear on the other side of this second door? the sonorous voice of a divine in the act of preaching this made the villain he said recommend this to us as a private passage i am strongly tempted to return and cut his throat 
he then opened very gently the door which led into a latticed gallery used by the marquis himself the curtains of which were drawn perhaps with the purpose of having it supposed that he was engaged in attendance upon divine worship when in fact he was absent upon his secular affairs there was no other person in the seat for the family of the marquis such was the high state maintained in those days sat during service in another gallery placed somewhat lower than that of the great man himself this being the case captain dalgetty ventured to ensconce himself in the gallery of which he carefully secured the door never although the expression be a bold one was a sermon listened to with more impatience and less edification on the part of one at least of the audience the captain heard sixteenthly seventeenthly eighteenthly and to conclude with a sort of feeling like protracted despair but no man can lecture for the service was called a lecture for ever and the discourse was at length closed the clergyman not failing to make a profound bow towards the loudest gallery little suspecting whom he honoured by that reverence to judge from the haste with which they dispersed the domestics of the marquis were scarce more pleased with their late occupation than the anxious captain dalgetty indeed many of them being highland men had the excuse of not understanding a single word which the clergyman spoke although they gave their attendance on his doctrine by the special order of Macallum moore and would have done so had the preacher been a turkish imam but although the congregation dispersed thus rapidly the divine remained behind in the chapel and walking up and down its gothic precincts seemed either to be meditating on what he had just been delivering or preparing a fresh discourse for the next opportunity bold as he was dalgetty hesitated what he ought to do time however pressed and every moment increased the chance of their escape being discovered by the jailer visiting the dungeon perhaps before his wonted time and discovering the exchange which had been made there at length whispering ronald who watched all his motions to follow him and preserve his countenance captain dalgetty with a very composed air descended a flight of steps which led from the gallery into the body of the chapel a less experienced adventurer would have endeavoured to pass the worthy clergyman rapidly in hopes to escape notice but the captain who foresaw the manifest danger of failing in such an attempt walked gravely to meet the divine upon his walk in the midst of the chancel and pulling off his cap was about to pass him after a formal reverence but what was his surprise to view in the preacher the very same person with whom he had dined in the castle of ardenvor yet he speedily recovered his composure and ere the clergyman could speak was the first to address him i could not he said leave this mansion without bequeathing to you my very reverend sir my humble thanks for the homily with which you have this evening favoured us i did not observe sir said the clergyman that you were in the chapel it pleased the honourable marquis said dalgetty modestly to grace me with a seat in his own gallery the divine bowed low at this intimation knowing that such an honour was only vouchsafed to persons of very high rank it has been my fate sir said the captain in the sort of wandering life which i have led to have heard different preachers of different religions as for example lutheran evangelical reformed calvinistical and so forth but never have i listened to such a homily as yours call it a lecture worthy sir said the divine such is the phrase of our church lecture or homily said dalgetty it was as the high germans say gans forder flick and i would not leave this place without testifying unto you 
what inward emotions i have undergone during your edifying collection and how i am touched to the quick that i should yesterday during the refection have seemed to infringe on the respect due to such a person as yourself alas my worthy sir said the clergyman we meet in this world as in the valley of the shadow of death not knowing against whom we may chance to encounter in truth it is no matter of marvel if we sometimes jostle those to whom if known we would yield all respect surely sir i would rather have taken you for a profound malignant than for such a devout person as you prove who reverences the great master even in the meanest of his servants it is always my custom to do so learned sir answered dalgetty for in the service of the immortal gustavus but i detain you from your meditations his desire to speak of the king of sweden being for once overpowered by the necessity of his circumstances by no means my worthy sir said the clergyman what was i pray you the order of that great prince whose memory is so dear to every protestant bosom sir the drums beat to prayers morning and evening as regularly as for parade and if a soldier passed without saluting the chaplain he had an hour's ride on the wooden mare for his pains sir i wish you a very good evening i am obliged to depart the castle under macallum moore's passport stay one instant sir said the preacher is there nothing i can do to testify my respect for the pupil of the great gustavus and so admirable a judge of preaching nothing sir said the captain but to show me the nearest way to the gate and if you would have the kindness he added with great effrontery to let a servant bring my horse with him the dark grey gelding call him gustavus and he will prick up his ears for i know not where the castle stables are situated and my guide he added looking at ronald speaks no english i hasten to accommodate you said the clergyman your way lies through that cloistered passage now heaven's blessing upon your vanity said the captain to himself i was afraid i would have had to march off without gustavus in fact so effectually did the chaplain exert himself in behalf of so excellent a judge of composition that while dalgetty was parleying with the sentinels at the drawbridge showing his passport and giving the watchword a servant brought him his horse ready saddled for the journey in another place the captain's sudden appearance at large after having been publicly sent to prison might have excited suspicion and enquiry but the officers and domestics of the marquis were accustomed to the mysterious policy of their master and never supposed aught else than that he had been liberated and entrusted with some private commission by their master in this belief and having received the parole they gave him free passage dalgetty rode slowly through the town of inverary the outlaw attending upon him like a foot-page at his horse's shoulder as they passed the gibbet the old man looked on the bodies and wrung his hands the look and gesture was momentary but expressive of indescribable anguish instantly recovering himself ronald in passing whispered somewhat to one of the females who like rizpah the daughter of ea seemed engaged in watching and mourning the victims of feudal injustice and cruelty the woman startled at his voice but immediately collected herself and returned for answer a slight inclination of the head dalgetty continued his way out of the town uncertain whether he should try to seize or hire a boat and cross the lake or plunge into the woods and there conceal himself from pursuit in the former event he was liable to be instantly pursued by the galleys of the marquis which lay ready for sailing their long yard-arms pointing to the wind and what hope could he have in an ordinary highland fishing-boat to escape from them 
if he made the latter choice his chance either of supporting or concealing himself in those waste and unknown wildernesses was in the highest degree precarious the town lay now behind him yet what hand to turn to for safety he was unable to determine and began to be sensible that in escaping from the dungeon at inverary desperate as the matter seemed he had only accomplished the earliest part of a difficult task if retaken his fate was now certain for the personal injury he had offered to a man so powerful and so vindictive could be atoned for only by instant death while he pondered these distressing reflections and looked around with a countenance which plainly expressed indecision ronald mackay suddenly asked him which way he intended to journey and that honest comrade answered dalgetty is precisely the question which i cannot answer you truly i begin to hold the opinion ronald that we had better have stuck by the brown loaf and water pitcher until sir duncan arrived who for his own honour must have made some fight for me saxon answered mackay do not regret having exchanged the foul breath of yonder dungeon for the free air of heaven above all repent not that you have served a son of the mist put yourself under my guidance and i will warrant your safety with my head can you guide me safe through these mountains and back to the army of montrose said dalgetty i can answered mackay there lives not a man to whom the mountain passes the caverns the glens the thickets and the quarries are known as they are to the children of the mist while others crawl on the level ground by the sides of lakes and streams ours are the steep hollows of the inaccessible mountains the birthplace of the desert springs not all the bloodhounds of argyle can trace the fastnesses through which i can guide you sayest thou so honest ronald replied dalgetty then have on with thee for of a surety i shall never save the ship by my own pilotage the outlaw accordingly led the way into the wood by which the castle is surrounded for several miles walking with so much dispatch as kept gustavus at a round trot and taking such a number of cross-cuts and turns that captain dalgetty speedily lost all idea where he might be and all knowledge of the points of the compass at length the path which had gradually become more difficult altogether ended among thickets and underwood the roaring of a torrent was heard in the neighbourhood the ground became in some places broken in others boggy and everywhere unfit for riding what the foul fiend said dalgetty is to be done here i must part with gustavus i fear take no care for your horse said the outlaw he shall soon be restored to you as he spoke he whistled in a low tune and a lad half dressed in tartan half naked having only his own shaggy hair tied with a thong of leather to protect his head and face from sun and weather lean and half starved in aspect his wild grey eyes appearing to fill up ten times the proportion usually allotted to them in the human face crept out as a wild beast might have done from a thicket of brambles and briars give your horse to the gilly said ronald mackay your life depends upon it och oh exclaimed the despairing veteran eu as we used to say at marshall college must i leave gustavus in such grooming are you frantic to lose time thus said his guide do we stand on friend's ground that you should part with your horse as if he were your brother i tell you you shall have him again but if you never saw the animal is not life better than the best colt ever mare foaled and that is true too mine honest friend sighed dalgetty yet if you knew but the value of gustavus and the things we two have done and suffered together see he turns back to look at me be kind to him my good breechless friend and i will requite you well 
so saying and withal sniffling a little to swallow his grief he turned from the heart-rending spectacle in order to follow his guide to follow his guide was no easy matter and soon required more agility than captain dalgetty could master the very first plunge after he had parted from his charger carried him with little assistance from a few overhanging boughs or projecting roots of trees eight foot sheer down into the course of a torrent up which the sun of the mist led the way huge stones over which they scrambled thickets of them and brambles through which they had to drag themselves rocks which were to be climbed on the one side with much labour and pain for the purpose of an equally precarious descent upon the other all these and many such interruptions were surmounted by the light-footed and half-naked mountaineer with an ease and velocity which excited the surprise and envy of captain dalgetty who encumbered by his headpiece corslet and other armour not to mention his ponderous jack-boots found himself at length so much exhausted by fatigue and the difficulties of the road that he sat down upon a stone in order to recover his breath while he explained to ronald mackay the difference betwixt travelling expeditus and impetitus as these two military phrases were understood at marischal college aberdeen the sole answer of the mountaineer was to lay his hand on the soldier's arm and point backward in the direction of the wind dalgetty could spy nothing for evening was closing fast and they were at the bottom of a dark ravine but at length he could distinctly hear at a distance the sullen toll of a large bell that said he must be the alarm the storm clock as the germans call it it strikes the hour of your death answered ronald unless you can accompany me a little farther for every toll of that bell a brave man has yielded up his soul truly ronald my trusty friend said dalgetty i will not deny that the case may be soon my own for i am so for Faufen, being as i explained to you impetitous for had i been expeditus i mind not pedestrian exercise the flourish of a fife that i think i had better ensconce myself in one of these bushes and even lie quiet there to abide what fortune god shall send me i entreat you mine honest friend ronald to shift for yourself and leave me to my fortune as the lion of the north the immortal gustavus adolphus my never-to-be-forgotten master whom you must surely have heard of ronald though you may have heard of no one else said to francis albert duke of saxe lonenburg when he was mortally wounded on the plains of lutzen neither despair altogether of my safety ronald seeing i have been in as great pinches as this in germany more especially i remember me that at the fatal battle of nerlingen after which i changed service if you would save your father's son's breath to help this child out of trouble instead of wasting it upon the tales of shanachies said ronald who now grew impatient of the captain's loquacity or if your feet could travel as fast as your tongue you might yet lay your head on an unbloody pillow to-night something there is like military skill in that replied the captain although wantonly and irreverently spoken to an officer of rank but i hold it good to pardon such freedoms on a march in respect of the saturnalian license indulged in such cases to the troops of all nations and now resume thine office friend ronald in respect i am well breathed or to be more plain i pray sequar as we used to say at marischal college comprehending his meaning rather from his motions than his language the son of the mist again led the way with an unerring precision that looked like instinct through a variety of ground the most difficult and broken that could well be imagined 
dragging along his ponderous boots encumbered with thigh pieces gauntlets corslet and back piece not to mention the buff jerkin which he wore under all these arms talking of his former exploits the whole way though ronald paid not the slightest attention to him captain dalgetty contrived to follow his guide a considerable space farther when the deep-mouthed baying of a hound was heard coming down the wind as if opening on the scent of its prey black hound said ronald whose throat never boded good to a child of the mist ill fortune to her who littered thee hast thou already found our trace but thou art too late swart hound of darkness and the deer has gained the herd so saying he whistled very softly and was answered in a tone equally low from the top of a pass up which they had for some time been ascending mending their pace they reached the top where the moon which had now risen bright and clear showed to dalgetty a party of ten or twelve highlanders and about as many women and children by whom ronald mackay was received with such transports of joy as made his companion easily sensible that those by whom he was surrounded must of course be children of the mist the place which they occupied well suited their name and habits it was a beetling crag round which winded a very narrow and broken footpath commanded in various places by the position which they held ronald spoke anxiously and hastily to the children of his tribe and the men came one by one to shake hands with dalgetty while the women clamorous in their gratitude pressed round to kiss even the hem of his garment they plight their faith to you said ronald mackay for requital of the good deed you have done to the tribe this day enough said ronald answered the soldier enough said tell them i love not this shaking of hands it confuses ranks and degrees in military service and as to kissing of gauntlets pauldrons and the like i remember that the immortal gustavus as he rode through the streets of nuremberg being thus worshipped by the pules being doubtless far more worthy of it than a poor though honourable cavalier like myself did say unto them in the way of rebuke if you idolize me thus like a god who shall assure you that the vengeance of heaven will not soon prove me to be a mortal and so here i suppose you intend to make a stand against your followers ronald voto adios as the spaniard says a very pretty position as pretty a position for a small peloton of men as i have seen in my service no enemy can come towards it by the road without being at the mercy of cannon and musket but then ronald my trusty comrade you have no cannon i dare to aver and i do not see that any of these fellows have muskets either so with what artillery you propose making good the pass before you come to hand blows truly ronald it passeth my apprehension with the weapons and with the courage of our fathers said mackay and made the captain observe that the men of his party were armed with bows and arrows bows and arrows exclaimed dalgetty ha 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 have we robin hood and little john back again bows and arrows why the sight has not been seen in civilized war for a hundred years bows and arrows and why not weaver's beams as in the days of goliath ah that dugald dalgetty of drumthwacket should live to see men fight with bows and arrows the immortal gustavus would never have believed it nor wallenstein nor butler nor old tilly well ronald a cat can have but its claws since bows and arrows are the word even let us make the best of it only as i do not understand the scope and range of such old-fashioned artillery you must make the best disposition you can out of your own head for my taking the command whilk i would have gladly done had you been to fight with any christian weapons is out of the question 
when you are to combat like quivered numidians i will however play my part with my pistols in the approaching malay in respect my carabine unhappily remains at gustavus saddle my service and thanks to you he continued addressing a mountaineer who offered him a bow dugald dalgetty may say of himself as he learned at marischal college non egat mari joculus nece arcu nec venenatus gravida sagittus fuse faratra wilk is to say ronald mackay a second time imposed silence on the talkative commander as before by pulling his sleeve and pointing down the pass the bay of the bloodhound was now approaching nearer and nearer and they could hear the voices of several persons who accompanied the animal and hallooed to each other as they dispersed occasionally either in the hurry of their advance or in order to search more accurately the thickets as they came along they were obviously drawing nearer and nearer every moment mackay in the meantime proposed to captain dalgetty to disencumber himself of his armour and gave him to understand that the women should transport it to a place of safety i crave your pardon sir said dalgetty such is not the rule of our foreign service in respect i remember the regiment of finland cuirassiers reprimanded and their kettle-drums taken from them by the immortal gustavus because they had assumed the permission to march without their corslets and to leave them with the baggage neither did they strike kettle-drums again at the head of that famous regiment until they behaved themselves so notably at the field of leipzig a lesson whilk is not to be forgotten any more than that exclamation of the immortal gustavus now shall i know if my officers love me by their putting on their armour since if my officers are slain who shall lead my soldiers into victory nevertheless friend ronald this is without prejudice to my being rid of these somewhat heavy boots providing i can obtain any other succedaneum for i presume not to say that my bare soles are fortified so as to endure the flints and thorns as seems to be the case with your followers to rid the captain of his cumbrous greaves and case his feet in a pair of brogues made out of deerskin which a highlander stripped off for his accommodation was the work of a minute and dalgetty found himself much lightened by the exchange he was in the act of recommending to ronald mackay to send two or three of his followers a little lower to reconnoitre the pass and at the same time somewhat to extend his front placing two detached archers at each flank by way of posts of observation when the near cry of the hound apprised them that the pursuers were at the bottom of the pass all was then dead silence for loquacious as he was on other occasions captain dalgetty knew well the necessity of an ambush keeping itself under covert the moon gleamed on the broken pathway and on the projecting cliffs of rock round which it winded its light intercepted here and there by the branches of bushes and dwarf trees which finding nourishment in the crevices of the rocks in some places overshadowed the brow and ledge of the precipice below a thick copse wood lay in deep and dark shadow somewhat resembling the billows of a half-seen ocean from the bosom of that darkness and close to the bottom of the precipice the hound was heard at intervals baying fearfully sounds which were redoubled by the echoes of the woods and rocks around at intervals these sunk into deep silence interrupted only by the plashing noise of a small runnel of water which partly fell from the rock partly found a more silent passage to the bottom along its projecting surface voices of men were also heard in stifled converse below it seemed as if the pursuers had not discovered the narrow path which led to the top of the rock or that having discovered it the peril of the ascent 
joined to the imperfect light and the uncertainty whether it might not be defended made them hesitate to attempt it at length a shadowy figure was seen which raised itself up from the abyss of darkness below and emerging into the pale moonlight began cautiously and slowly to ascend the rocky path the outline was so distinctly marked that captain dalgetty could discover not only the person of a highlander but the long gun which he carried in his hand and the plume of feathers which decorated his bonnet tossen tieflin that i should say so and so like to be near my latter end ejaculated the captain but under his breath what will become of us now they have brought musketry to encounter our archers but just as the pursuer had attained a projecting piece of rock about halfway up the ascent and pausing made a signal for those who were still at the bottom to follow him an arrow whistled from the bow of one of the children of the mist and transfixed him with so fatal a wound that without a single effort to save himself he lost his balance and fell headlong from the cliff on which he stood into the darkness below the crash of the boughs which received him and the heavy sound of his fall from thence to the ground was followed by a cry of horror and surprise which burst from his followers the children of the mist encouraged in proportion to the alarm this first success had caused among the pursuers echoed back the clamour with a loud and shrill yell of exultation and showing themselves on the brow of the precipice with wild cries and vindictive gestures endeavoured to impress on their enemies a sense at once of their courage their numbers and their state of defence even captain dalgetty's military prudence did not prevent his rising up and calling out to ronald more loudly than prudence warranted caraco comrade as the spaniard says the long bow for ever in my poor apprehension now were you to order a file to advance and take position the sassenach cried a voice from beneath mark the sassenach sidier i see the glitter of his breastplate at the same time three muskets were discharged and while one ball rattled against the corslet of proof to the strength of which our valiant captain had been more than once indebted for his life another penetrated the armour which covered the front of his left thigh and stretched him on the ground ronald instantly seized him in his arms and bore him back from the edge of the precipice while he dolefully ejaculated i always told the immortal gustavus wallenstein tilly and other men of the sword that in my poor mind tasselets ought to be made musket-proof with two or three earnest words in gaelic mackay commended the wounded man to the charge of the females who were in the rear of his little party and was then about to return to the contest but dalgetty detained him grasping a firm hold of his plaid i know not how this matter may end but i request you will inform montrose that i died like a follower of the immortal gustavus and i pray you take heed how you quit your present strength even for the purpose of pursuing the enemy if you gain any advantage and and here dalgetty's breath and eyesight began to fail him through loss of blood and mackay availing himself of this circumstance extricated from his grasp the end of his own mantle and substituted that of a female by which the captain held stoutly thereby securing as he conceived the outlaw's attention to the military instructions which he continued to pour forth while he had any breath to utter them though they became gradually more and more incoherent and comrade you will be sure to keep your musketeers in advance of your stand of pikes lockaber axes and two-handed swords stand fast dragoons on the left flank where was i i and ronald if ye be minded to retreat leave some lighted matches burning on the branches of the trees 
it shows as if they were lined with shot but i forget ye have no matchlocks nor habergians only bows and arrows bows and arrows ha 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 here the captain sunk back in an exhausted condition altogether unable to resist the sense of the ludicrous which as a modern man-at-arms he connected with the idea of these ancient weapons of war it was a long time ere he recovered his senses and in the meantime we leave him in the care of the daughters of the mist nurses as kind and attentive in reality as they were wild and uncouth in outward appearance End of chapter 14